So first thing that I want to say, this is a, a still a work in progress, and this is my first time presenting this, so probably I will stop a little bit to think and try to explain a little bit better, but uh, hopefully I can get some feedback from you and that will be really a help for us. So the first thing that uh, so I want to acknowledge is my contributors. Uh, uh, this is a joint work with Sandro Gallo from UFISCAR, uh, Giulio Iacobelli, and Guilherme also from UFRJ. And uh, today what I want to talk a little bit is about animal behavior. Right? And when we talk about animal behavior, I think the first question is what is animal behavior? Right? And this is a typical question, like as uh, William James would say, something that we know when we see, but not necessarily we know how to define. Right? So, but for example, when we see a bird flying, we know that this is an animal behavior thing. Right? When we see, for example, this is a marmoset, a baby uh, vocalizing, and we know that this is a behavior. And by the way, this is a, a behavior that I study for a long time now. Well. Cats uh, sleeping. Right? I think that everybody has seen uh, cats sleeping, and this also we know that is a typical behavior of a cat. Again, you know, this is a uh, human driving and texting at the same time. Right? It should not be a behavior that we, we want to see all the time, but we see quite frequently. You know? So this is also uh, animal behavior. So, but then the question is, what is not an animal behavior then? Hopefully everyone can see that this is a ball going down the hill. And this is a, a, typical, a typical example where we would say, okay, this is not an animal behavior. But you say, oh, Daniel, but this is not even an animal. <laughs> yeah, first of all, that makes sense, okay, it's fair. But we know that even things that are clearly not animal would have something that we would call a behavior. So uh, this is like a short video of a robot Right. And as you can see, you know, definitely it's not an animal, but we can interact and we would call that the, the robot is having some behavior. It's going forward or it's trying to avoid or it's interacting with the hand and so on and so forth. Right. I mean, you can say, oh, but still, this is maybe something that is uh, it's, uh, it has a computer, you know, there is some specific uh, feature to it. Again, it's fair enough, but that's also not necessary. Right? So this is actually it's a, very, a very famous actually structure uh, called the Strand Beast by Theo Jensen. And this is actually really interesting. If you have time, you know, I highly recommend you to go to YouTube and check, check it out. But this is what's really interesting about this is that this is actually a structure constructed only with tubes and some tissues, and there is no uh, motor or anything like this, but still it interacts with the wind and it gives a clear impression of a behavior for us. Right? So this is also another example of strand beast. And again, there is no motor or anything, just interacting with the wind and tubes. Yeah. And I think that everybody agree with me that it seems that you know they are having some sort of uh, behavior or something very similar to an animal. Right? So essentially, this kind of a structure object in we would call in general animals. So it's something that is similar to animal, but doesn't need to be an animal. So now the 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 simple question would be to ask: Okay, what is the difference between an animal and something that is no animal? Okay. I think that is a very natural question. And this is obviously, you know, it's not the, I'm not the first one to ask this kind of question. This is actually, it's a question that exists for millennia. Maybe, maybe one of the first uh, documents uh, related to this question is given in um, The Anima by uh, Aristotle. So Aristotle asked the same kind of question. So what is the difference between something that is uh, it's animate and non animate? And his answer, is actually something similar to what, what I'm trying to claim here. That there is actually a, some some feeling of autonomy to these objects. Right? So essentially, when we look at this object, we have a feeling that has some agents or some autonomy to these kinds of objects. So and this is this is the the main difference. Right? And the question of the next is then where does this feeling of autonomy come from? Okay, so. What's the origin of this autonomy? Okay. 
And then on again, so this is a question that was asked like uh, for a millennia, for millennia. But maybe one interesting answer to this question was given by the biologist Jacob Buxtow. Eh? So he's a German biologist, very famous one, okay? And he introduced the concept of uh, Umwelt. Eh? So Umwelt is a German word that means essentially environment, but in his usage, Umwelt is the self-centered world. Eh? So essentially is the world that's, that is seen and perceived by the animal. Okay, so it's a, it's a, essentially, it's a subjective world. Yeah? So uh, this is an illustration by him, uh, so from his famous book, book a Foray into the World of Animals and Human. And uh, here in the left, right, so this is the world as seen as it is or as seen by humans, for example. Right? So, and you see the sea urchin, and now he thought, okay, how the sea urchin would see the world, okay? And here in the right, what you see is the essentially the model of what he's imagining, actually the what would be the umwelt of the sea, the sea urchin. So and what you see is that the fish, okay, the boat and the cloud are all the same thing because essentially they the, the sea urchin doesn't interact with these objects. So for them, for, for the sea urchin is the same thing. Right? So this is another example. This is from the bee. So in the left, you can see the bee and a lot of flowers and the trees and so on. And in the right is the is the his uh, depiction of how actually the bee would be seeing the world. Right? So and you can see that it's quite different how we would see the world. Okay, so this is a, a, a another example. I will, it's a short video that I will play now, and it's a video where it shows how actually a bird would see the world, and how actually the a fly would see the world. Okay. So hopefully people can see the video. I don't know if everybody uh, can see the video, but essentially you, I think it went a little bit fast, but essentially the, the birds, you know, see the world quite different because first they have, uh, they can they can see the UV light, okay? The second, the way that they focus is totally different and the speed that they, they change the head movement and so on is also totally different. So essentially how they interact and they see the world is different. The fly is the same thing. Huh? So fly is a much tinier than for them as humans. They see with several multiple lenses and, and they see the world much smaller, much slower, right? In a, in, in a more decomposed way. Right? So this is so essentially the, the way that they interact with the world is totally different. Okay? And what's the consequence of this idea of Umwelt? So the consequence of the idea of the Umwelt is the following. Right? So let's say that here in the blue, the blue circle is our Umwelt. Right? So it's representing our Umwelt, how we see and interact with the world. Okay? And in the red here, what we see is the animal's umwelt. Again, how the animal sees, perceives, and interacts with the world. No? Obviously, we can we share some parts of the umwelt. So we see some, we see and perceive some some few stuff in a similar way. But definitely, there are parts of the world that we don't see and we don't interact in the same way. And that is the part that it's not in the intersection. It's outside the intersection. That is the hidden umwelt from from us. Okay. So now, the, here is the, the main point that I want to make, is that the reason that we feel that the animal has an autonomy is exactly because there are parts of the umwelt that we cannot, uh, that is hidden from us, okay? So the fact that there is a part of the, essentially the umwelt of the animal, okay, that is hidden for us, and that is what makes actually make us feel that there is some sort of autonomy into the animal. So when you think about the rock, well, that's, uh, you see that actually we have actually the rock, the whatever we see in the rock, we, we, the, the, if there is an umbert of the rock, everything is included in our umbert. But that's not the case for the animal, for the robot, and so on. Just also too, I want to for that there is always our, the world outside of us, and we interact with all of them together. So the, the next question then, okay, so obviously this is a hypothesis, okay? But this is, I think it's a very reasonable hypothesis why actually we give some autonomy agents and why this, this is a very a fundamental characteristic of animal behavior. And if that's the case, what we would like to do as an experimenter or observer 
would be to try to model what's going on. So first, what we would model is obviously the shared model, so the part that actually we can we have access and we can observe. And how usually people do it? Again, you know, a lot of people model animal behavior. And what they are essentially doing exactly is trying to model shared models. And I will present one way that I think it's very common uh, among the theoreticians how to model animal behavior. Okay, so the way that we model animal behavior very frequently is actually to model as a movement, as a dynamic in a phase space. Right? So for example, the most obvious way to think is that the axis here in the phase space that I'm showing, okay, where I'm written shared umwelt, in the x axis, the y axis is just the position of the rat, for example, in a box, for example. Okay. And the ball, uh, the dot is the position of the animal. That would be one example of the behavior, right? So the position of the animal. The other, the other, the other um, possibility is, for example, is that, for example, we are modeling how, um, how thirsty or satiated is, for example, an cat, right? So if the set, so if the, the, the coordinates in, in the x, y in this phase space could, for example, represent the degree of thirstiness right? and or degree of how satiated such are the cat, is the cat, right? So, and here, so I just to give an example, what, what would be happening, let's say that actually uh, these dynamics go forward. Can you, yeah, go, go again, next, please. Yeah. And then, you know, eventually, you know, the animal, for example, if it's a rat here, for example, it can, can will we'll follow the dynamics and will interact with the world. And once it's interacted with the world, what will usually happen is that the dynamics change again. So, okay, for example, in the rat example, we can, we could imagine that the rat is is running through the box, and whenever it comes close to to the to the wall, okay, it changes the dynamics such that it avoids the wall. Okay, so if it's the cat is thirsty, right, whenever it reaches the world, means for example, in this example, could mean that it starts to become satiated, and once it's satiated again, it changes the dynamics. Okay, and again, and then once it changes the dynamics, it will follow the dynamics. Next, please. It goes, goes until next. Yeah, it will hit the wall again. It will hit actually the the umbelt, so, and and it will continue the dynamics. Right? So the question now is, what makes the dynamics to change? Right? And here, the by construct again, you know, so starting from the, our uh, our assumption, the only thing that can change in now the dynamics is what is in the hidden umbelt, right? Because we, what we are seeing here is everything in the shared umbelt. We have the world. So the only thing that can change now the, the dynamics is, is in the hidden umbelt. So which means that the, in this uh, our assumption, we, are, we, we, are, we will be assuming that there, that there is a dynamic in the hidden umbelt that would control the, the dynamics in the shared umbelt. Right? So here, for example, I'm representing by two parameters, for example, by F prime and G prime represents the parameters that control the dynamics. And let's say that in the very beginning, okay, the dynamics that we saw, right, it was in this uh, purple region. So it's represented by this purple G region. And whenever it's a, the dynamics in the shared uh, umbelt uh, hits the, hit the wall or interact with the world, yeah, you see that the the then the 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 process in the hidden umbelt will change. Okay, so just to try to explain a little bit better. So let's say so here you have the shared umbelt and you have the hidden part. Okay, and what's going on that you have a dynamics on the on the shared part, right? And let's say that it's uh, the the rat or the cat or whatever whichever animal you want to choose. So it's it's doing something in the in the face space, and whenever it's it's uh, it interacts with the world, it will change. Yeah? So for example, in this case, it will change for the B, and for it will and then we will transition to the B to the C. Okay. So this is pretty much the conceptual model that I think it's uh, it's a consequence of the idea of umbrellas. Right? Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, at this point, uh, you know, people say, ah, there, is, there are a lot of similar ideas man, out there. And I totally agree. Okay, so <laughs> I'm not claiming any kind of originality here. The only thing that maybe I would like to uh, emphasize here 
is that um, maybe the most famous uh, idea that is kind of, is very is popular idea that is similar to what I'm saying here is the idea of hidden Markov model, right? so hidden process in general. The main difference I would say, okay, that usually in the hidden Markov model, okay. Obviously, you have a structure that is very similar, the hidden part and the shared part. The, but the main difference is that the hidden part is not influenced by the, the shared one. So you don't have this closed feedback generally. Okay? But we can discuss a little bit more in the end. Okay. So obviously, we, can, uh, we don't want to start trying to, um, to solve every uh, problem that is as complex as I uh, I just said, although it's a conceptual model, too, it's quite complicated. So we want to simplify more, and actually not only simplify, it's really a simplistic model in the sense that we actually uh, lose almost everything, but we keep only some key features so that we can understand a little bit what is the mat mathematical structure of these kinds of ideas. Right? So let's say that here we, we, we are thinking that the state space for us is actually just actually the interval between minus n in n okay so here on top and this is uh, the blue just i'm putting in inside the blue box just to say that this is what's happening in the shared room belt right and here we are we are we are we have actually a random walk i think everybody knows what the random walk is but if you, you don't know it's actually quite simple so let's say that you have a particle here in zero in this case Okay, and the, what the random walk would do is to go to the right or to the left with certain probability. Okay, that's the, it's very simple. And then in this case, whenever what, what we were modeling as interaction with the world is just when actually this random walk hits the minus n or n. Okay, and in this case, the probability to go to the right or left, okay, is uh, characterized by the parameter p. Okay, so n you will see that actually this random walk, it's, uh, although it's quite simple, it's slightly different from the usual one. Right? So it's not homogeneous in the sense that if you see the interval between one and n on the right side, you see that the probability to go to the right is p, but the probability to go to the left is one minus p. Okay? But if you look at the, the interval between minus n and zero, the probability to go to the right is one minus p. So, okay, now it's flipped in this time and the probability to go to the left is p, okay? And now let's try to, so let's imagine how we would simulate this kind of uh, dynamics. Huh? Okay, so first, so the, let's say the random walk went, went to, to one, to, to the next, to the, to the right, okay? With, okay? And then next, yeah, so it goes to the right again, and next, and now it go to the left, okay? And so on and so forth until it reaches n or minus n. In this case, it's rich, it's rich at minus n yeah, at time tau, okay? And then once it's reached the tau, what happened? Exactly as in the, our conceptual model, something happened in the hidden movement. And what happened is that you will choose with some probability, with some probability mu, another parameter in this case. And then again, the dynamic was now we will have the, the random walk uh, the same, essentially the same random walk, but with different parameters, okay, going on, okay? I hope it's, it's very clear. Uh, well, it's, it's more or less clear, I would say. I would expect. <laughs> and then, what is the interpretation of this P here? So, remember that in our conceptual model, the, then in the dynamics, we have something like a flow to represent how the dynamics would happen. Here, we will have something very similar, right? So, we will have what we call the potential, Right. The potential is this thing, in, is this thing in the blue, and we see that if the p is less than half, well, what will happen is that it means that if in, in the interval between minus n and zero, the tendency is to go to zero because the probability is larger than half to go to zero, and that's this. And when we look at the interval between one and n, the probability to go to zero is also high. Right? So essentially, you see that there is actually. You can imagine that there is actually this kind of potential right? or the cost function or whatever you want to call, where there is a tendency to go to zero. So it's much easier to go to, to, go to zero than to hit the n or minus n. Right? And now when the, for example, in the P, the, pro, the parameter is larger than half, it's exactly the opposite. Right? So it's much easier to hit now minus n n than to hit the zero. So, okay, so now uh, I, will, I will try to introduce some, um, 
some results. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand exactly why, but the, the the work is the following: whenever it hits, okay, it's uh, essentially it's uh, it's uh, it's having a renewal. Right? It starts again from the zero. So it hit n or minus n, it will restart again from zero. So that's the how the work is defined. That's the answer. So the chain model. Uh, Daniel, I guess okay. the question okay. is how you go from the border mm -hmm. to the center. Uh, I guess so, that's... so, so the so uh, essentially the, the the essentially the random walk re has a it's a, like a renewal renewal process. It will restart it from zero again, so we'll come back to the zero. So once it hits, it goes back to zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it seems to be fine. Okay, mm -hmm. exactly. So it will come back to zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some uh, some definitions. Okay, these are uh, very simple definitions. Hopefully, everybody uh, can follow. So, so let's say that we call the tau n essentially the first time that the random walk x n okay hits minus n. Or n. Okay, so it's the time essentially when it hits the door or interacts with the world. Okay, yeah, and we introduce also probability mu that is between epsilon one and epsilon. We just avoid the zero and one just to avoid some trivialities here, and then that will, and we use this mean to generate the the parameter the, the sequence of the parameter pk. Right? So the pk is a sequence of i add the random variables with a distribution mean. And also we define something that is pretty much um, it's very simple, but um, maybe it's not defined in such a very easy way. But essentially, pet n okay, is exactly the uh, the process that represents the the parameter that the run the parameter at which the random walk is running. Right? So if you go back to the to the figures, so he, these dots are exactly the, what I'm defining as theta, theta n. Okay, so obviously you know, we can make the model more complicated, but here I will focus on a very simple case. Okay, so and all, as I said, you know the key to understand animal behavior is to try to understand what's going on in the in the hidden movements and the parts that we don't observe. So let's say the one thing that we want to understand, for example, is how frequently one the certain parameter is chosen. Right? So that's the idea. And the one way to quantify this is actually to define this LNA, okay, LNA, which is just the counting, okay, the number of times that the parameter stays with that value. Right? So essentially, what is written here is exactly what I just said. Okay. Okay, and now we have a very simple result. Right? So the result is that if we observe for a long time this process, so when the small n goes to the infinity, what we see is that this occupation measure would converge to something very well defined. Right? And it's something that is quite intuitive. Essentially, it's something that it's a weighted average. Okay, so you see here in the in the uh, numerator, right? the weighted average of the of the expectation of the hitting time, so the time that the random walk takes to hit minus n, n for each parameters. Okay, so that's pretty much the 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 result. Right? And again, I think that this is quite intuitive, especially if you think that, for example, mu is concentrated, let's say, in two parameters. Right? So if it's the mu would, was concentrated in two parameters, you would think that okay, whenever it's chosen, let's say that it's concentrated p1 in p2. Okay, and if it's concentrated only p1. No, sorry. If it if it chose if it choose the P one, it will stay there right? with a time that is more or less the expectation of the hitting time. There, if it goes to the P two, it will spend the time of the hitting time for that parameter. And essentially, obviously, the probability that we observe yeah, uh, when the small n goes to infinity, obviously, the, the empirical probability would depend on this expectation. Daniel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just to uh, can you come back on the previous slide? Just to 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 mention that you you use tau for eta in the picture, no? For the first time you hit. Ah, yeah. Sorry. Ah, yes. <laughs> I put, uh, this is actually it, there is a typo. Sorry, I'm very sorry for this. So in proposition one here, where is written eta? Yeah, it's tau, as Sandro just uh, remind me. 
Sorry for this. It's, a, it's not at end, it's tau end. Sorry for this. Mm -hmm. So I did a very uh, small simulation here. So using mu, the uniform between 0, 1 and 0, 9, OK? And the big N, which is the size of the system 10 here. Right? And here on top, now we have the histogram with the, um, of the mu. And you see that it is more or less uniform, right? Yeah, I simulate, I think, 10,000 points here mm -hmm, of the random walk. And here uh, um, in the bottom, you see actually the distribution of the, occup the occupation measure, right? So, and what you see is essentially what, and what we see is that now we start to see cer a certain type of concentration where the distribution starts to become more concentrated on the smaller values of the, of the interval zero one, right? Like in zero one, right? It will be concentrated around the zero one, okay? Just to, um, um just want to emphasize that in the y axis here it's in the log scale so essentially it means that whatever is close to zero one actually is much higher than whatever is around zero seven zero eight and zero nine and so on and so forth right? and then here is uh, maybe uh, at this point it's very clear for everyone but i think what's interesting is that the you know the although the mu is chosen independent and the uh, and the uh, the Although the mu is chosen independently, what we see in the end is something that obviously depends on the time that the, the walk, the random walk, spend on that parameter. So given this, now probably the next question might be easy to answer is the following. So what happens when n goes to infinity? So when the system becomes really big, okay? And in this case, exactly as we we already the the previous simulation and the results suggest that p n would converge to the uh, delta epsilon, which means that everything will be concentrated on the smallest value of the epsilon of the um, of the process here, so of the of the parameter space here, right? And what's the why the reason? So yeah, so here is the picture that I think might, might make the everything very intuitive. And so when p is less than half, when well, obviously it will be really hard to get out from zero, okay. And whenever of, and smaller the p, higher the probability to go to zero, and smaller the probability to go to n and minus n. Right? So essentially, it means that when actually the, the 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 size of the system, the n becomes bigger and bigger, what will happen is that essentially this uh, potential will start more and more concentrated around zero. So that's pretty much the idea, right? Mm -hmm. So, and what is the biological interpretation for this? So here, the um, this is a proposal biological interpretation. So essentially the idea is that uh, the certain behavior that we observe, okay, in, in when that we observe, let's say the cat sleeping, right? why we observe the cat sleeping, we can use um, a Boltzmannian argument where the reason that we see the, the cat sleeping is simply because the cat spend most time, more time sleeping. Right? So it's kind of almost a tautology, but actually it's, in, it's, uh, it's uh, um, inverse a little bit the, the usual logic that we use in biology, right? where we usually think that the, the cat sleeping because there is some function, but here we are saying, okay, maybe the reason that the cat sleep is just because is the behavior that actually take uh, take longer to to change. So that's the idea. Mm -hmm. Daniel, I'm sorry. What is delta epsilon? What is epsilon there? Here is epsilon is the is the minimal value on the distribution mu. So mu is a probability distribution. Actually, we are um, in epsilon one minus epsilon here. And now the question, the, all the next question that I think it uh, seems to be logical is to ask what, how it scales. Right? So, and what I mean by this, yeah, so let's say that we take um, P that is smaller than half, right? And then we can ask, okay, how actually the, how long you know, the animal will spend, what's the, the typical time that the animal will spend on a certain behavior, right? When the P is, is, is less than half. And obviously this is, it's, uh, we can use the classical result and this will be essentially like, pretty much like exponential. Right? So it will converge in the exponential distribution. Right? And obviously we have a lot of specialists here in the, in the audience and this is, uh, looks like a lot, like a metastability, like a behavior. Right? And when actually the P is larger than half, 
Okay, when the, the parameter that is chosen larger than half, what we will have is that the typical behavior will be pretty much deterministic. So essentially, we have a predictable duration. Okay, and this is quite interesting because this um, suggests okay that the the heat suggests a, caric a caricature, a, caric a caricature of the process that's going is going on in the hidden umbel. Yeah? And the caricature is the following. Huh? So it's very simple. That essentially there will be, for example, two regions here of the parameter space. One that is when below 0, 05 and the one that above 0, 05. And essentially what's going on in the in the hidden umbel is a combination of unpredict of, of behavior that has unpredictable duration which is exponential that has a metastability like a behavior and uh, behavior that have that uh, deterministic um, deterministic duration right? so essentially here on top you have the short and transient uh, behaviors that will have a deterministic like um, duration and here in the bottom you will have a behavior that will have unpredictable uh, durations right? Okay, here, um, just to um, finalize uh, my talk, I will give, uh, this is an example from a data from a friend of mine, you know, uh, back at EBIT, and this is, was already published, and here the experiment that the uh, Beckett did is the fun. Essentially, the, uh, the monkey was fixing the eye in a center in, in, in the screen, okay? And suddenly would appear three targets in the screen, okay? And then the behavior that the, the monkey has to do is to choose among one of the three targets and stays there, keep there with the eye. Right? So, and the eye would be like uh, moving in that region for a while, yeah? Until it gets or don't get a reward and then everything will restart again. Again, the, the monkey has to fix and so on and so forth, okay? And what Beckett did was actually to count the time that the animal spend on, uh, on each target. So, 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 sorry, the time that the animal spent before switching the targets. And here you have, we have a very interesting distribution. What, what uh, Beckett saw is that actually, the the time that the animals spend between targets was actually a mixture okay of two exponentials right so when he tried to fit a single exponential he cannot fit well but when once he fits actually uh, with two exponential he fits really well the distribution of the time that he spent with the targets right? and this actually just to uh this reminds us a lot okay that the our results with the with the occupation time where actually the occupation time is just a weighted average okay of um weighted average of the time spent in each each uh for in each parameter so this actually this final result kind of goes in the similar direction i'm not saying that's our model actually explains explain whatever is here but it just suggests that it's something uh it seems to be in a similar direction where actually the the final behavior that we find it is it, it will be something like a combination of exponential distribution with uh, uh, different parameters mm -hmm. so what's the take-home message okay so the take-home message that i would like to to claim but i don't know if it's uh, it's really supported, but I think it. I think it's going in this direction. Is that the animal behavior is really an emerging phenomenon? Okay, that is that appears because of the interaction between the shared umwelt, the hidden umwelt, and the world right? at di and different temporal scales. So, usually, okay, the idea to study these parts in separate, which is becoming, I think, more and more common in biology might not be give the answer about understanding what is the animal behavior. And so a little bit in, um, in, a, in a provocative um, way. So recently we have a movement in neuroscience where actually the main claim is that if you really want to understand uh, behavior, right, maybe it's, uh, we should um, study not only the brain, but we should understand how actually the brain interacts with the, the animals and, and how it interacts with the world. And that's it. That's my, uh, my thoughts. Thank you so much. Next. Mm -hmm.
I, I was thinking about the example with the double exponential we present at the end. Mm -hmm. This uh, um, pushes me to think about uh, a situation of a double well potential. Mm -hmm. uh, like in this picture of um, you, you have a random a random topography mm -hmm. and you can get trapped in a in a domain of attraction and then mm -hmm. eventually you, you you get out and then you get attract in another one which is even deeper and so on mm -hmm. uh, so, could you please say something in this direction so uh, yes 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 so that actually it's a great question uh, thank you for the for asking so that's true so when you look at the occupation uh distribution uh distribution essentially it's a mixture it's a mixture of the um, the waiting time a multiple essentially weighted by the mu right so, essentially, so when you look at the the final result yeah we can you cannot actually really distinguish it as you said, by a double well, something that is a double well, from the process that we are suggesting. Okay, it's the difference. I think you know. I think that it's not so easy to distinguish between them. But the one thing that uh, I think is different is really how uh, we are uh, conceptually thinking about the process. So when you think about double well, pretty much you are thinking that everything is accessible, in some sense. Uh, but in our case, we are assuming that not everything is accessible, and the thing, the part, the thing that we see maybe is only parts of the well, and we have something that we cannot access. Although the final result would be something very similar, when the I think the the difference is exactly on this this um, in this direction. I think. Mm -hmm. I think one aspect of of non-machine behavior is mm -hmm. variability. So you mm -hmm. confront, you do the same experiment, you control everything, and the response is different. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. see variability in your model. In particular, my question is, could you see some sort, say, of phase transition mm -hmm. when you change mu? Yes. Yes. Um, change mu. Uh, yes. So actually, so okay. So I think there are yeah so the thank you again for <laughs> the nice question so i think there are two things that i would like to answer. yes so the, i obviously i went uh very superficial on the role of mu right but if we consider for example uh for example one thing that i didn't consider what happened for example in the p equal half right, right? Mm -hmm. right? and then obviously if we consider a mu that has a positive weight for example in the probability to have half okay Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the the uh, the, fi the final result could could be could be slightly different from what I I, I just proposed. Right? So um, again, I'm just going a little bit too fast because uh, we have some models where actually depending on how we choose the mu, okay, the the final uh, the convergence could be different. It could be actually that it it even doesn't converge to uh to one single parameter but actually it converts to something that still is a distribution mm -hmm. okay the, sec the second question about a little bit going uh further on the phase transition part actually we can for example think of a model where actually for example we have a model that we call the uh, uh alternate well model okay where actually it's a combination of two single two single well model so the model that i just presented is something that we are calling single well okay and we can have for example two single wells where actually the the or the the well, the minimum is not in zero but in one well it's in it's in the in the between zero and n and then the other is in the between zero and minus n okay so there is two Okay, and then what could happen is that um, the process could be alternating between both. Okay, and then you can ask what will happen actually when the end goes to the infinity. And actually, what we find is a behavior that is similar to phase transition. Actually, it can it can either stay in the right side or it can even stay in the left side. Mm -hmm. Hi, Daniel. Uh, it's Antonio hey. Rocco here. Thank you for your nice talk. Um, uh, I have a general question, perhaps not totally related to your talk, but could be related to an extension mm -hmm. of it. Um, several researchers claim that uh, to understand animal behavior and robot behavior as well uh, mm -hmm. would require embodiment. You need yes. to embody your 
your your being uh, because mm -hmm. of the constraints imposed by the mm -hmm. environment. How do you mm -hmm. think uh, this could be incorporated into your modeling? Yes. So actually, the uh, the or the the beginning of the the model that I just presented actually it was based on this kind of idea of embodiment and how the environment can be relevant. Huh? So and the way that the um, the environment actually influence is through for example one way to think is that actually the um, the well that the so the n and minus n that, that i'm telling you is actually for example is the um, is the effect of the environment right so because whenever it hits right it chant and that could be the the, um, the effect of the environment the other part actually where the effect of environment could be relevant is actually how actually the the p is actually is, is um is chosen because in the in the model that I presented, right, there is a symmetry between the right, right side and left side. Right? But maybe depend on the environment. Essentially, how this uh, p is chosen could be slightly different. Right? So, what I want to what I want, want to say is that the the it is a still very um, how can I say very. Uh, it's still a starting point, but the idea of the model is really to try to incorporate the fact that the the, the effect of the environment through this uh, this different parameterization of the model. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to know if, aside from uh, simulation results, uh, there is uh, some mm -hmm. uh, uh, theoretical study of the limiting distribution as uh, time goes to infinity of the occupation time for the random walk. Case. Yes, so so actually the, it was the first proposition that um, I showed. Actually, that we have actually a, a explicit formula, explicit uh, formula for the uh, for the asymptotic distribution when the n, big n is fixed and the small n goes to infinity. Actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, so, uh, yeah. I was curious if there is as a, a formula. Yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah, it's here. So proposition mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, uh, but this is a general form of one cannot really appreciate, uh, you know. Uh -huh. how... Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for very specific, maybe I should I should have um, put some uh, some special cases. So if it's uh, for example, if it, um, if it's the the distribution, if the mu is actually discrete, okay, you can actually write down a formula that is really nice. That is just a weighted average of these uh, expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the expectation. Ah, okay, so now I think maybe I know. Yeah, and the expectations of the waiting time, the hitting time, the expectation of the hitting time. Okay, we have a formula for it, right? So, for example, in this case, right, if the p is less than half, okay, it has a, it, a, it's exponential, right? And then the, it's um, if the if the p is uh, is larger than is larger than half. Okay, it goes, it's linearly pretty much. So actually, we can write a formula that is more explicit than this. I think this was the question. Hmm? Mm -hmm. um, I hear a talk in which you, we, we claim that some singer has a metastable behavior. Mm -hmm. The question is the following Do you have experimental evidence that the times we stay in one of these uh, situations is really exponential? So yeah, so what I wanted to give in the in my final um, uh, experiment by my friend is it's a little bit of, uh, in this direction. Right? Obviously, there, there is a there, well, there is some better. There should be there sh we, we have to get a better data set. But I think that that uh, data set going that direction. The, the combination of exponential kind of suggests that it's really sorry. The, go back to the formula. Yeah, this formula. Yeah, it's something similar to this formula. Mm -hmm. Like if you have two weights, right, and uh, and essentially it will be two, it will be switching between two exponentials. So it suggests that maybe there are two uh, metastable states in the in the in my friend's data set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 